ahead of the 2023 general elections, the Redeemed Christian Church of God, RCCG, has created a department to mobilize support for its members, including Vice President Yemi Oshibajo, who may be interested in running for office. Now, a memo dated February 28th further directed regional, provincial and local heads of the Pentecostal Church to replicate similar desks in their respective domains and appoint officers to man them. Although the vice president, a senior minister in the church, is yet to openly declare his intention to run for the 2023 presidential elections, analysts are opining that the move is a ploy to mobilize sweeping support for his ambition. Yet, the vice president is believed to be facing stiff contention from his erstwhile political leader and benefactor, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, for the ticket of the All Progressive Congress, APC. Well, joining us to discuss this is Ihe Ibeji, uh, Kach Ononoju, both our political analysts and also Shokwe um, Ilori, he is a preacher. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Laurie, because you are a preacher, and this has to do with a church. It's the first time a church, a very well-known church in Nigeria, is stepping up to the plate to even think of having a political department. Now, a lot of people are welcoming the idea because, you know, many people have somewhat blurred that line between religion and politics, saying that both can coexist. Uh, but there are those who think that politics should stay out of church. So I put it to you. When you heard this news, where you are among the people who applauded it and said, well, it's high time that this happened, or are you in a position to the idea? Well, uh, well thank you very much for, for, for having me. When I heard this news, I actually saw a copy of that memo that was sent from the Redeemed Christian Church of God. I, I saw that this evening, and I believe it's a very, very welcome development. I believe that it is about time because um, the church does not exist in a vacuum. We do exist in the nation. And the nation, what goes on in the nation and the things that have to do with leadership also affect the church. So if it is about time that we took uh, our, our uh, destinies in our hands and, and began to participate. It's, it's all well and good if we begin to uh, criticize and, and, and talk about leadership or pray for them. But the Bible does implore us to, to, to watch and to pray. So what means to participate? And then to, to pray means, of course, we, which is what we do. So we're participating. So it is around, around about time that the church rose up and began to do something about leadership in Nigeria, because we have more than enough resources in the church to, to, to fill places of leadership and, then, and do, uh, I believe, a much better job than is being done now. Um, the Bible says in Revelation 1, chapter, chapter 6, uh, verse 6, that God has made us kings and priests on the earth. Now, the area of priesthood is where you talk about religion. But when you talk about a king, it talks about authority, political authority. So if God has equipped us to be kings and priests, we cannot just focus on one part and leave the other. It will be responsible. Hmm. So the fact that the redeemed Christian God has done this is a very welcome development. Hmm. Why did the Redeemed Church of God not do this the whole time? We've had governments come and go. Why was this not an idea that was raised? Why now that there are speculations that maybe the vice president might be in uh, interested in running for office? And I want to ask you, you ask me why? I want to ask you why not? Because it, it is when you decide that you want to do something, it's the best time to do it. All right? So maybe we've sat back and we watched all of these years. And I'm when I say we, I mean the church. We sat back and we watched, we watched all of these years. What? This is the time. I mean, the time, the, the time yeah, there's no time out like the now. This is the first time we're having a vice president. No, I, and I do not believe that what the redeemed Christian church of God did is because of the vice president. The vice president has not even indicated interest in running. He has not. So I know that what they are doing or what has been done is not for the vice president. It cuts across all political offices and the, the believers are now going to be encouraged to go and join political parties and then become um, uh, functional members of those parties. And then people from church will back them up. Hmm. Right? So asking me why, why now? Because now is, is the best time. Now is the best time. The best time to do something that you should have done you know, uh, for long ago is now. So now is the best time. That's the, that's okay. the reason. That's my okay. 
I'm going to go to you, Mr. Nenuju. Um, just, just like he said, well, he's saying that the timing is proper. This is the best next time to, you know, get the church involved. But I'm curious, isn't there a danger in letting those lines cross, especially when a church is a place where you have people from different works of life with different political standings and different interests? Will it, will it not look like these people are being pointed in a particular direction? Well, thank you. The first thing I would like to tell you is that the church is simply reacting to what the mosque has done well before now. I'm sure you remember the man, Esa Pantani. Pantani is a frontline member of the Islamic Salafist movement. And here in northern Nigeria... Oh my goodness, I think uh, we're having connection issues there with you. Mr. Anunuju, can you hear me? This movement. Uh, actually, I can hear you well. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, can... Good. The church is simply playing catch-up. Okay, and this particular thing you're talking about is something in that the members of the Salafist movement have been deeply in it. Mr. Isa Epantani, today a minister for digital economy and communication in Nigeria, is promoted by the Salafist movement. The Salafist movement are Sunnis. So here in northern Nigeria, the Sunnis are massively in it. Buhari has had a sustained uh, support by the Sunnis. So I see nothing wrong with the Christians also waking up because if you have to look at Nigeria, Nigeria by population is a Christian country. But because the Christians are not this, I will. Uh, I think we have another um, disruption there, but, but we'll, let me come to you here while we try to correct that. Yes. Um, we're beginning to talk about this across the lines that we're trying to blur, religious yeah. lines. Yeah. We know that Nigeria, obviously, is um, divided along religious and ethnic lines. And um, if we begin to look at our political office holders or push for political holders from those same lines that we're complaining that we need to blur, I'm not in any way shooting this down, so welcome to development, but how do we make sure that it does not become another monster in the room? Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, uh, first, first and foremost, um, politics and the church has been around for quite a while. I mean, the time of the black movement, you have the Martin Luther Kings, Reverend Jesse Jackson. They, they galvanized support, political support, um, when, when it had to do with the extremist issues. Um, the time of the Roman Catholic period, um, the popes um, wielding such powers that have to do with authority, both in the Christian way and the political manner. In terms of blurring lines, these are lines that you have to, um, you, you, you have to uh, move with wisdom. Because at this point in time, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thin line between religion and the truth righteousness. So um, if, we breed, if we say we breed righteousness in the church and people are coming to worship God in the church, um, there should be leadership that is enough to take care of the needs and suffering of the people. Hmm. So would you want to would you want to would you want to allow the lines not be blurred and sit back while suffering go, continues? Hmm. Or would you want to take the mantle and drive the leadership that people would believe in and say okay this is what it's supposed to be? As much as I, I, and I don't I'm not trying to play the devil's advocate here. I'm just asking the questions that need to be asked. Yeah. These same people that we were saying that are not necessarily leading us right, are not doing the necessary things that need to bring the people out of the doldrums, are in our churches. Yeah. They sit in the front rows, the, the commissioners, the ministers, the politicians, they are part of the church. So when we say that we're trying to push somebody from the body to be in those positions, these same people, so I'm trying to understand how do we, how do we differentiate between the guy who is fit for leadership, who will deliver, compared to just saying, well, he's our church member, let's galvanize support for them. Sometimes I ask myself whether it is a question of the devil that you know is better than the edger that you don't. Um, a, lot, a huge, in a huge propensity, that is what it seems like a lot of times. Um, because, I mean, he's in your fold. Um, so he's somebody that you, you, you see every time. He's somebody who comes in piety with his family. So all of a sudden you begin to accept that this is somebody who you can hold 
onto. But a lot of times we forget the fact that um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when he emerges as a powerful man in, in, a, in a position of power, all of a sudden he surrounds himself with the paraphernalia of power. You cannot reach him. Yeah. So there's that fear. And guess what? It happens. It is real. So you're correct. There is a need to be, to be careful with this push. Um, I mean, it's not, a, it, it, it's, it's, not like, uh, it's not like something that was not well thought out, if you ask me. I mean, this is a massive following, over 5 million. Wow. I mean, anybody who you want to, full, anybody who you want to push forward would have quite a lot of following. But it's, it's, it's existed over time. And, um, and it, even in the current dispensation, even the current political um, manner, structure, it has always played out in that manner. So I think that what it will be eventually will be to exercise a lot of caution, mm. to, to, to really come down to being that devil that we know is, <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just a bl the blunt truth. It's, um, it's preferable to the, to the angel we don't. Uh, um, back to you, Mr. Laurie. Uh, again, I'm going to pressure you because you're a preacher here. Um, Pastor Paul at Dave Arasin, um, Pastor Tunde Bakare, um, I think we also have in that regard the living faith pastor, uh, David Oyedepo. These are men of God who've been very vocal in terms of leadership, what our leaders are supposed to be doing. And of course, they're also very good at criticizing these leaders. So now that we have a lot of um, leaders, preachers who seem to be standing up for, um, you know, not just Christianity, but speaking truth to power. Should, are we going to be seeing more churches saying, well, we want to have a political desk. We want to be able to also galvanize. Should every church, that's my question, uh, the body of Christ, as we call it, be looking in this direction to push for more people within the faith who tend to look at this idea of politics as a dirty game? Should every church begin to toe the line of the RCCG? And again, um, Ms. Onunudu made a statement about the Sunnis who are pushing for their people to also be in power. And I guess they also hold them uh, to some level of responsibility. How does the church do that so that these people do not go rogue? Okay. Um, if you think about the greatest issues or the problems we have with political office holders today, um, your, one of your, your guests over there was talking about uh, the, the fact that absolute power corrupts. We need to have people who are, are grounded, who you can hold accountable and reel back in if they begin to drift. But in a situation where, you know, you mentioned and you said that, you know, that how do we differentiate it or delineate between the people who are already in church and in uh, positions of power and the people who we want to push forward? Now, the people who are, you know, who are in positions of power are not really in church. What they do is they use the church when they need to use the church. And they come to church and, like you said, they probably sit in the front row and all of that. But if we have a situation where the church has a political arm that, you know, um, holds accountable and vets those people who want to go forward. Now, if I'm going to, if you're in my church, the fact that you're in my church should not be enough for me to support you. I need to, I, I need to check you out. I need to know your antecedents to know what are your what, what are your what do you what is driving you, what's your motivating force if a leader cannot tell us why he wants to aspire to leadership then there is no point um supporting or backing that leader up now if the church rises up and begins to push people forward that is the people that are ready to serve and have been vetted by the church then we are the ones who can hold the people we push forward accountable the era of Godfatherism is basically the same thing. Somebody, you, you, you put somebody in office and then you become the Godfather over that person and then you, you, you dictate everything that he does. Now, I'm not saying that the church is going to become, um, uh, is we're going to hold bondage. I was, I was about to take you on that one, but you're, you're, you're lucky. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, let me land on that. I knew you were going to take me up on that. But what, what would happen is that when we have people, actually, the first thing, that I would think that the church would check out is what is your history in service in the church and in the community? And are you God-fearing? Now, guess, look, think about the fact that you mentioned some men of God who have been speaking the truth to people in power. What if the person in power is not only somebody who is in power that is far away, but is a member of their congregation? 
They can go to the to the fellow and say, uh, uh, my dear brother, although you are the governor, although you are the president, what? you are not going the way that you are to us to go. In the Bible, there are, there are times when the, the, the prophets, they used to go to the king directly and speak to them mm. and tell them, no, you have deviated from what God said. So we need to have that part, that part back in okay. our political life. All right. You can speak to those in power. All right, let me come back to Mr. Nunuju. I, I hope we have him back. Uh, Mr. Nunuju, it's interesting that this is a welcome development for many. Um, but... Oh, I think that we have not been able to get him back. Okay, so I'm going to come back to you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, now that he's telling us that, well, okay, it's safer to have these men and that we can hold them to hold them responsible. I want to point to the vice president. He's been a pastor for yeah. years before okay. he became the vice president. He's been an attorney general, served excellently. But can we say that this government has really pleased the church? Has this government pleased the people? Should we still be looking for pastors? I mean, I can go back as far back as Pastor Joshua Dari. We know how it ended. We've had so many of these guys who are pastors, who have these appendages, but did not necessarily deliver. So I don't know if it's... I'm still struggling with being a church member, checking their track record. If I want something from you, I could do everything to get your attention. And once I get that thing, all you see is my back. So... Is it about just being in church or is there supposed to be some form of um, boot camp and for, for the want of a better way to describe it, to make sure that we can get good leaders? I mean, they don't fall from trees, but how do we do that? Thank you very much for um, echoing my, my exact thoughts. Quite frankly, the excitement about this whole thing is, is I mean, it's, it's general to a certain level, but there needs to be some level of planning and structure around it. Uh, you, you, you hit the nail spot on on the head. Now, the, the churchgoers, the people who go to church, they are common men like you and I, and they, they've gone through the, the ills and the sufferings that have been faced over the years across every administration. So even they themselves must be circumspect because they have one of theirs who has been in government or who has been in government severally, all right, um, a lot of them, and in, in terms of um, changing, changing things the way they wanted to, it hasn't come out that way. Um, a lot of them may not be so so too satisfied with what they're getting. Mm. Um, maybe this is them saying, okay, you know what, you, you have been there as um, a support. Can we have you at the top? But aside that, I'd like to see what the structure is going to be like. Mm. Like every, for instance, every bank loan, do you get to see, do we get to see a guarantor? So if he gets into power, will he come back for Holy, Go Holy, Week, um, Holy Ghost Congress? <laughs> or <laughs> the know? experience. Yeah, or the experience. Will he come back to church for okay, that? Okay, we we're out of time. So, Mr. Nuju, I'm going to let you have the last say. Unfortunately, the internet cut you off. Um, how do we see this playing out in the future? And how do we also make sure that because it's a church thing, it doesn't also make the man who goes to the mosque feel left out? No. The man who goes to the mosque is already in this game all the church is trying to do is also to equalize don't forget as i was trying to say before the letter point off it's a pantami it's a loyalist of the salafist movement and even buhari himself is also a salafist so if i watched shegumi started over 10 years ago has now forced a lot of the salafist people right now on government if you like it this particular government of President Buhari is something has had a strong nepotic slant actually February members of the Southeast movement. And if you look at the country, as I said, in numerical sense, it's actually a Christian country in terms of domination. So there is nothing wrong if the Christians also come out the same way the Muslims have come out to actually embrace politics. At the end of the day, it's going to be good going forward. So I don't really see a problem. Okay. Let us see how we play out. I see nothing wrong in this. Well, I want to say thank you to um, the guest tonight. I want to say thank you to Shope uh, Ilori. He's a preacher. Um, Katja Nunaju is a political analyst. And Ihe Ibeji also is a political analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being thank part of the conversation. Thank you. You're welcome for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you very much for having right. me. Well, thank you all for staying with us. As we round off today's show, we will bring you highlights of this week's conversations. And of course, don't forget Plus TV, uh, Plus Politics, I beg your pardon, returns on Monday at 7 p.m. And we're here every single weeknight. I am Mary Anacone. Have a good night and enjoy your weekend.
Now, the problem is not as much with the constitution or with the framework as it is with the way we practice it. I don't think the real challenge is the constitution or the legal framework under which we operate. It is part of the problem, but I don't think it's the main challenge. Part of the challenge we face is the leadership recruitment process. How are these guys elected? Are they true representatives of the people? If you notice, um, you may have observed that in the political process, um, I don't think very often it is governors or some very members of the, uh, some very powerful political elite that will literally handpick those who will run on the platform of various political parties. So these guys come with a mentality that they are not representing the people, they are representing whatever interests that forced them on the ticket of the political party. Now, they, of course, they provide resources, they get elected, and they know mm. that primarily they are not representing the people. Zoning is one of the political uh, strategies of uh, the lazy political class who have nothing to offer uh, to just reduce uh, the geographical sphere of people who could consider them to be competent. I said, I don't believe that you need to zone offices to people uh, who just belong to political parties but don't want to have the required competence and experience. You know, as I have, uh, you know, I'm using the word experience uh, uh, clearly, not the way they are using or the way they have abused it to run a country. Uh, I don't, I don't believe in zoning, and I've said that several because we have zoned. Uh, you know the office of the president and other political offices into i mean to different hands and they have left nigeria a broken place there is also a role for the family and society and celebrity culture but you know with TikTok and social media and celebrity culture these things happen in two three minutes if that whereas nation building is a serious issue the wind needs to be discussed from different perspectives and delve into. So it's not something a celebrity on TikTok can, can transmit in a, a, a four, four second video. These are serious issues that need to be talked about seriously within the proper structure and context. It's mm. multi-layered and everyone has a role to play. Religion has a role to play. Our traditional rulers, our traditional institutions have a very important role to play. Mm. For me, as a woman of Kensha Town, I have a role as a traditional ruler to provide an example to the young girls and women in my society. And even having that position says to those women, here is somebody who has attained this position and I can do so within a traditional context. I think the APC is trying to resolve their crisis the best way possible. If you look at what they're doing currently, rather than allowing Buni to scuttle the next election and the next convention, they decided to move, you know, get him out of the place and put in somebody, uh, Governor Bilo, uh, with a mandate to organize the convention. Otherwise, there'd be a crisis if they shift it again on March 26. And that is not what they want. Yes, um, the president will certainly have a view on who should be particularly the chairman of the party. But we should not forget what they've done in APC currently. What they simply try to do now is to resolve all the problems of them. Uh, what they've done, what, they, what, what we call lateral zoning. The lateral zoning is about you know, dividing the country into two constituencies, that is the North and the South. And all the offices currently occupied by the North will now be moved to the South all the offices in the south will be moved to the north. And then from there, you now have the micro zoning, you know, uh, within each constituency to now zone those posts to different areas. So they are trying to resolve it in a representative way and in a way that would lead to less conflict.